Those of you that know me are aware that I was trained by Jesuits, and they always insist before you do a presentation that you have to tell a story, and you have to involve a case study to uh, make the presentation more powerful. So we'll begin with a, a story, since we're talking about alcoholism in the elderly, an, an age-old disease in, in old age. Uh, so here's the story. You, you heard about the fourth grade teacher who wanted to instruct her class about morals. So she asked them to go home, sit down with their family, get a story from the family, and construct a moral from it, a daunting project. The next day, the class assembled, and she said, okay, who wants to go first? Little girl Mary had her hand up. She said, yes, Mary, what's your family story with a moral? She said, well, my dad's a chicken rancher. Last week, we got all the eggs that the chickens had laid, put them in a, a laundry basket, got in a pickup, drove to market, hit a bump, the basket flew up, several of the eggs broke on the roof of the pickup truck. And the teacher said, what, what's the moral of this story? And Mary said, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Another little girl had her hand up, Joni. She said, Joni, what's your moral from your family story? She said, my daddy's a chicken rancher. And last week, we took 12 eggs that were fixing to hatch into chicks to sell them in town, and only nine of the 12 hatched. And the teacher said, what's the moral of your story? And she said, don't count your chickens until they're hatched. And way in the back of the class was mischievous little Johnny. He was busting out of his desk. He was the only one with his hand up. The teacher reluctantly called on him, and he said, uh, last night, teacher, I sat down with my dad. He told me about his brother Bob, my Uncle Bob. And during the war, Uncle Bob was a fighter pilot, he was flying a mission. His plane got hit, and he had to bail out. And in the cockpit, he had a bottle of whiskey and a machine gun. So he grabbed both of them. And as he parachuted out, he landed in the middle of 100 enemy soldiers, took his machine gun out. He killed 80 of them until he ran out of bullets. Then took a knife out of his pants pocket, killed another 10 until the blade broke, and he strangled the last 10 with his bare hands. Now, this is a fourth grade class. Some of the kids were crying. The teacher was exasperated. And finally, the teacher said, little Johnny, what is the moral of your story? And he said, don't mess with my Uncle Bob when he's drunk. Okay. Now, we all get a, a tickle out of that story because I think it's about the unpredictable and belligerent and violent behavior that people can manifest when they're intoxicated. But let's change the subject to a, a case study. So let's look at a 79-year-old gentleman, widowed gentleman, who has a history of hypertension and diabetes, and he's admitted into the hospital because he feels weak and dizzy. And when he's admitted, his blood pressure's up, his pulse is up, his uh, Blood sugar is 355, although he declares adamantly that he's been taking his blood pressure medicines and his uh, insulin. And uh, they, they get some additional history from uh, his daughter. Uh, you know, uh, what do you know about your dad? She said, well, the last few months he hasn't been answering his phone. And when I've seen him lately, the house is just in great disarray and disordered. And he's a meticulous gentleman. He's, uh, his hygiene's dropped off. Not sure he's eating right. And the, the astute physician says, uh, is it possible that your dad's drinking? Oh, no, no. He, he doesn't abuse alcohol. He never has. And then two days later, this gentleman becomes extremely agitated, very shaky, and he actually has a withdrawal seizure. Um, they discover from a best friend that this gentleman's been consuming a bottle of whiskey a day since his wife passed away nine months ago. So he's now transferred after being stabilized and treated for his alcohol withdrawal seizure. And once his blood pressure and glucose are improved, he's now transferred to an, a geriatric alcohol treatment unit. So 
we've got the case study. Let's kind of proceed. This is our goal, eh? A long, healthy, happy life, although we might quickly ascertain that perhaps this centenarian is addicted to nicotine. Um, you know, aging to perfection, I think, is what we all seek. But uh, we have to be a wee bit careful because... You know, we really age in two ways, don't we? We age chronologically, that's our birth date. And then we age physiologically, you know, our, our physical function. And I think we're becoming more and more aware that we can accelerate our aging process by what we do, what we eat, how we live. We can accelerate it or we can slow it down. So that, that's what we're going to address today and have a little outline. Okay, I'm an outline kind of guy. Uh, the next half hour or so, we're going to kind of look at six different areas about alcoholism in the elderly. Now, substance abuse is not a new problem. In fact, if you look at the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verse 20, you'll read that Noah was drunk with wine. Okay, so prehistory tells us about intoxication. Um, I think what baffles me as a physician is the mystery of why someone would initiate and persist in an obviously self-destructive behavior. And if you're a scientist, you say, what is it that, you know, starts this off and perpetuates it? And if you're a clinician... The question you'd ask is, what can we possibly do to modify the self-destructive behavior and curb it? But I'm convinced that I'm going to go to my grave uh, mystified by this particular illness. Uh, I had a very rude awakening to substance abuse treatment. I was a military doctor for a long time, and uh, my first day in private practice, my first inpatient, uh, at a private psychiatric hospital here in San Antonio, was a 65-year-old crack cocaine addict and dealer. And I just had never encountered anything like that in military service. So it was a kind of a quick awakening. Well, let's, let's kind of start. We'll start with the end first. Uh, since I'm a military guy, they always say, make sure you tell people what you want them to know, then tell them again, and at the end, repeat it. So... For those of you that are on a short leash, these are our simple three objectives today in looking at alcoholism in the elderly. Number one, please be suspicious. Always suspect that we tend to gloss over it as clinicians. We tend to minimize it. I mean, when we think about an elderly person, I think many of us have a kind of an idealistic, sweet grandmother type in our mind. Um, but please be extra suspicious when you see elderly people have unexpected or mysterious abrupt declines, okay? Think about it. It's always got to be in the differential diagnosis. Number two, as all of us age, we change. We change dramatically physiologically. And I'll go into detail about this in, in a wee bit, but quite simply, as we age, our sensitivity to the neurological, the central nervous system effects of alcohol heightens. And then the last piece, we've got to put a little good news in here. We don't want this to be all doom and gloom, is that elderly patients with alcoholism respond well to treatment. I think there's this myth that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, I can refute that because I have a very old dog, and I can still teach my doggy some new tricks. It may take a little longer, and I may have to reinforce it a bit more. But as far as I know, she's still learning new tricks. So the beginning here, the outline. Definition. The Jesuits always insist you have to define what you're talking about. So what's alcohol abuse? What's alcohol dependence? And, you know, I think if you ask the man on the street or the woman on the street, Maybe they'd give you a number. You know, it has to be so many drinks a day or a week or a month or an amount or type of alcohol or duration. 
But psychiatrists, we're a funny lot. We kind of live and die by the DSM-4, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, 4th edition. So this is our, uh, our standard, if you will. And quite simply, alcohol, we only look at two domains, if you will, alcohol abuse and alcohol dependence. So alcohol abuse, I won't give you the flowery language, but it, it's simply continued use of alcohol despite adverse consequences. So I'll give you a grotesque example. Uh, someone's uh, driving late at night on the weekend. They're weaving. They're pulled over. Uh, they're found to be intoxicated. They're uh, put in the drunk tank. Uh, the next day they uh, walk out and they go right back to the bar. One might say continued use despite dramatically adverse circumstances. This is at minimum alcohol abuse. Okay, Alcohol dependence takes it up a notch, as that uh, Cajun chef uh, likes to say. We're going to take it up a notch. And alcohol dependence implies the same criteria for alcohol abuse, continued use despite adverse events, if you will, or consequences. But it also implies three other components. Tolerance, a fancy word for you need a bigger and bigger dose to get the same effect. Withdrawal, physical withdrawal, when you stop the substance you're abusing, you have physical signs and symptoms of withdrawal. You shake, you sweat, you're nauseated, you're irritable, you can't sleep, your blood pressure goes sky high. Okay? But I think the essence of alcohol dependence is the last bullet there, loss of control. This is where... Drinking dominates the patient's literal every waking thought. They spend much of their waking day thinking about how to obtain it, using it, and then going right back to it again. So physical depend or I should say alcohol dependence, tolerance, physical withdrawal, loss of control. Now there's a third bullet there. It's not in the DSM four, but it's talked about in in substance abuse literature. Perhaps someday it'll be incorporated. And it's certainly talked about quite a bit in elderly alcoholism. It's called problem drinking. And, and I just kind of liken this to the pre-disease state. You know, we're very concerned now in medicine, what's the pre-diabetic state? What's the pre-hypertensive state? So problem drinkers may be, if you will, the, the pre-alcohol abuse, alcohol dependence. State. And it's arbitrarily been defined as those elderly at risk, but they don't meet abuse or dependency criteria. And now we're going to make it very fine-tuned. It's arbitrarily been defined as one drink a day and not more than seven drinks a week. And binge drinking is even further defined as not more than three drinks at a sitting. Okay. This is in 65 and older, if you will. So we've got our definitions, all right? How do we diagnose alcoholism in the elderly? Well, to begin with, does the patient meet criteria? Of course, that implies a history taking. And what do we know about uh, this disease in human beings, much less the elderly? It's quite often covert and secret. People have shame. Particularly older patients view alcohol abuse and alcohol dependence as a uh, loss of moral backbone. Um, they're not readily going to give you this information. But you have to ask. You know, it's the old, uh, the old saw, you won't find a fever if you don't take a temperature. So if you're going to ask one single question as a clinician, the simplest question is, how often do you have a drink? Okay, that, right away that kind of gives you duration, although I'll caution you, when I left private practice, uh, I remember vividly seeing an elderly gentleman taking my history. I asked him how often he drank. He said, I have one drink a night, Sonny. We finished the exam. Uh, as he left the office, his wife, actually, she actually grabbed me by my ear. And she said, uh, you need to understand that the one drink my husband told you about is actually a tumbler this big, and it's six shots of Jack Daniels. So right away, she taught me to quantify and define what is one drink. So how often do you have a, a drink of alcohol? Okay. 
And then I think it's essential whenever possible, particularly in this population, to try and get collateral history. Often collateral history is brought to you by the spouse or family members. Maybe this is a problem that's been long-standing and it's now uh, dramatically escalated. Now, as a physician, you know, we're carefully taught to pay close attention to what does the patient look like? What's their physical exam like? And there's a lot of telltale signs of chronic alcohol abuse. The uh, bulbous red nose of W.C. Fields, rhinophyma. The spider angiomatous, a breakdown of capillary veins in the arms, uh, the neck, the chest wall. Okay, The scleral icterus of uh, some early liver failure the difficulty with gait, okay? Um, and, of course, the mental status exam, uh, the way I was trained is the mental status exam begins when you see the patient, even if they're 100 yards off. How are they dressed? What's their hygiene like? What's their speech like? Uh, what's their eye contact like? What's their kinetics like, okay? Now, we have some indirect ways to get a handle on alcohol abuse in patients uh, through blood work. We'll, perhaps we'll see elevations in liver function tests, okay? In particular, GGT, gamma gluteal transferase, is an incredibly sensitive liver enzyme, particularly uh, elevated in binge drinking. MCV, mean corpuscular volume, is actually the diameter of the red cells. And with alcohol abuse, what we see is the red cells swell. And then, of course, uh, you know, the, the well-known but rarely done in the elderly, a blood alcohol test. Okay? Let's do toxicology. Now, we have some screening instruments. And I kind of put them in order of complexity, in order of length. The cage is probably the simplest, the most widely known. These are four screening questions. Have you ever attempted to control or cut down on your drinking? That's the C. Are you ever annoyed when people mention or object to your drinking? That's the A. Do you ever feel guilty about drinking? That's the G. And do you ever drink in the morning a bit of the hair of the dog that bit you as an eye opener? That's the E. And it's thought that, that if a patient answers yes to any one of those four questions, then we now need to pursue perhaps additional history. So the cage is quick, in office. It's not terribly specific, but it's easy to remember. Now, the other three questionnaires are variations on a theme. The MAST is the Michigan Alcohol Screening Test geriatric version. The audit is the alcohol uh, alcohol use disorders, uh, ind individual testing, and the ARPS is the, I can't remember because I'm 57, so it'll come to me in a minute. These are all longer, lengthier, uh, a little more specific, but not easily done uh, in, in the office unless you actually have the instrument in your hand. So these are all screening devices to better quantify uh, alcoholism in, in the elderly. Now, the pearl is... Primary care doctors rarely screen. It's not because they're derelict or negligent. They have bigger fish to fry. They're taking care of the elderly patient's congestive heart failure, their hypertension, their diabetes. It's probably the last thing on their mind, okay? And then hand in glove with this, I mean, this is a, a double-edged sword. Alcoholic patients are generally not going to volunteer this information. And when you pose questions to them, they're going to be superficial they're going to minimize it, or they may outright deny it. So this is a, an underdiagnosed, underrecognized syndrome. Okay. Well, how common is it? Now, you know, for, just for purposes of discussion, we're talking about the population 65 and older. Well, it's like most things in medicine. How common is it depends on where you're looking. So if we're looking at the community as a whole, you know, estimates range from 3 to 15 percent. These are patients 65 and older that meet criteria for abuse or dependency. So in the, the general community, you know, we're already into double digits, if you will. And then if we move into the hospital setting, 
uh, dramatic jumps by the triples. And, of course, it depends where in the hospital you're looking. If you're looking in a geriatric psychiatry unit, an internal medicine unit, you'll, you'll find high numbers there. And then, you know, there is the, the notion that in terms of problem drinking, this is far more of a male <coughs> disease than a female disease. Of course, the, the, the corollary to this is that uh, elderly females are, are much more susceptible to uh, prescription substance abuse and sedative hypnotic abuse than elderly males. Now, if you really want to be a wee bit demoralized, my home state, the great state of Illinois, conducted a survey looking at emergency rooms from uh, January of 1994 to December of 1996, and they looked at tens of thousands of patients admitted to the emergency room. About 24% of them, a quarter, were elderly, okay? And in this group, they tested 15% of this group for alcohol, and 50% were positive. So half were positive. They tested 5% for drugs, and 12% were positive. So you wonder what those numbers would be if they tested a the lot of them, okay? But, of course, we all know the, the really dramatic, dramatic data with alcohol, okay? 50% of the motor vehicle accidents we see are alcohol-related. Probably 40% of falls in the elderly are related to substance abuse. And then, of course, the saddest one of all is 50% of homicides and suicides are alcohol-related in the elderly. So this is something we need to look for, something we need to screen. shouldn't be at the bottom of the list. Well, why is this so problematic in the elderly? We hinted at this earlier. As we age, physiologically, we change. We've, we're all learning that as we get older. You know, what happened to that, uh, that wonderful physique we had when we were 20? But it's much more than that. As we age, quite simply, we have decreased total body fluid, both intracellularly and extracellularly. And then we have increased fat stores. Our muscle mass declines, our fat stores increase. And what this leads to is different distribution, different distribution of alcohol in the elderly and quite simply a greater central nervous system load or effect. And then, you know, this is like one of those infomercials, but there's more, okay? What do we know about the elderly in this country? If you're 65, you're on at least 4.6 medicines. So we have the added additive or synergistic effect of alcohol with the medicines that are on board. And what's the sum of all this? The sum is quite simply the elderly that use alcohol have less reserve, if you will, less uh, that resiliency of the rubber band is now near snapping, and they have far more delayed clearance of alcohol. It hangs around longer, and they're more sensitive to the central nervous system effects. Okay. Now, causes, uh, back to the great mystery. Why would alcoholism... Uh, be a problem in this subpopulation? Well, some of this might be self-evident. As we age, you know, we talked about the physiology, alcohol is going to have more of an effect, if you will, uh, more of a physical effect. But what else happens as we age? Well, you know, as we travel down this path, I think we encounter uh, more and more losses as opposed to more and more gains when we're younger. I mean, we certainly uh, begin to have tremendous changes in our physical health, our social life changes. Uh, occupationally, we're now retired. Emotionally, uh, we suffer losses. And I think, you know, we're mortals. We're flesh and blood. Uh, these are painful. And we do what we can, what we think helps, to salve the pain. All right. Genetics, it's, uh, it's just a... A whole new world now in looking at substance abuse because we're beginning, beginning to put some of the puzzle pieces together about why some of us are far more vulnerable to alcohol than others. You know, we talk about the uh, addictive personality. It's a nice idea, but what's that mean? Well, 
there's accumulating evidence that perhaps patients that, that suffer from alcoholism, suffer from drug problems, drug dependency, they may be genetically different from those of us that don't suffer from those problems. We see changes in terms of uh, dopamine in the central nervous system, opioid receptors, uh, GABA receptors, serotonin receptors. Uh, so we're beginning to try and identify genetically those patients that are most at risk. Cognitive impairment. Well, we've, we've talked about this in the earlier webcast. Uh, you know, as we age, we, uh, we're well aware now in 2010 about dementia and, and what is uh, one of the, the early features in dementia is we lose the ability to remember, lose the ability to learn. We also lose the ability to, to have judgment, if you will. So confusion reigns, okay? So that person that may have always had a, a single drink as a nightcap, not uncommon for them to say, did I have one drink or three or none at all? And then lastly, and I'm not, I'm not going to talk at any length about the connection between the incredibly lethal and legal drug in this country, tobacco, that accounts for 400,000 400, deaths a year. But the connection between tobacco use and alcoholism it's about 75%. So you'll rarely find a drinker, particularly an elderly drinker, that's also not a heavy smoker. In fact, another telltale physical sign is do they have yellow fingernails because they smoke dramatically or their teeth discolored. Now, it's curious. In the elderly, we see two patterns, if you will, of alcoholism, early onset and late onset. And uh, here's the tale of the tape. Early onset drinkers, these are folks that uh, have a strong family history of, of alcoholism. Their parents had it, their grandparents had it, and they begin drinking heavily and abusively in their teens and 20s, okay? They often are, are quite impaired psychiatrically. Uh, they they uh, obviously, or I should say, as it might imply, their early lives are disordered and they have trouble holding on to jobs, holding on to relationships. Their health suffers because they've begun to abuse substances heavily when they're young. They're not terribly compliant. They're very difficult to treat, if you will, and they frequently relapse. But if they survive into their later years, uh, these are the, the early onset drinkers. The other pattern that we, we note in the elderly are the late onset. These are patients that have not had substance abuse problems very early in life, that have little or no family history of uh, alcohol abuse or dependence. They've been fairly stable most of their days, uh, solid citizens contributing, uh, stable relationships, on the whole healthier. Um, but now, in their later years, maybe they're isolated, maybe they're alone, maybe they're bereaved like our case study gentlemen. They're widowed. And now late in life, what had been a, a social habit has now become a storm, a, a tornado, if you will. What about treatment? How do we treat this disease? Okay, think about, again, our case study gentlemen. Well, currently in 2010, we think of four levels of care, and that, that makes me feel kind of old because when I train, there were really only two levels of treatment. You're either an inpatient or an outpatient, and there wasn't a whole lot in between. And we still have those levels. I mean, we can still treat patients with this illness as an outpatient, or we can treat them in a very intense way uh, as an outpatient. What does this mean, intensive outpatient treatment? This is four days a week three hours a day, so this is a, a variety of group and individual and family therapy. Uh, the patient sleeps in their own bed every night. And in a way, this has some virtues. The patient is being treated in the real world, okay? 
But we can treat them in a residential, medically supervised unit. This would be the Betty Ford Clinic, the Hazleton Clinic in Minnesota, the Hanley Center in Florida, which specializes in treating the elderly alcoholic. And then, like our gentleman in the case study that had a, uh, a withdrawal seizure, you know, these are folks that need to be medically managed in a med medical unit because they're so unstable in terms of their vital signs and their health. Now, how do you know where to put somebody? Well, it's like anything in medicine. It depends. It depends on the patient's physical health. It depends on their history. Have they been through a series of outpatient treatments and failed them all? If so, it's time to now move to the next level of treatment. It depends on do they have lots of coexisting medical illnesses that need careful monitoring and attention. How stable are they? You know, do they have a coexisting psychiatric illness? Do they have a depression or a borderline personality disorder? And, you know, can we treat somebody as an outpatient if their partner is actively drinking? What's the environment for recovery? So all these things go into the, the decision-making process about what level of treatment would be best for the elderly alcoholic. Now, uh, the good news, great news, we've got a wide variety of treatment. Let's begin with non-pharmacologic uh, first. Particularly in the elderly, they're very responsive to the clinician. You know, these are, this is the greatest generation. They respect authority. They listen to orders. They follow commands, although they might be impaired. So patient education is always the first step, not criticism, not condemnation, but patient education. Mr. Flabitz, let's look at your blood work here. This is indicative of alcohol affecting your red cells, inflaming your liver, leading you to, to suffer from the symptoms you're having. We can do something about this. You can help yourself. So clinician advice and recommendations, making a contract with the patient. Now, you might say, uh-oh, wait a second. I thought with alcoholics, you don't ask them to cut down. You ask them to abstain, and that's true. But Rome wasn't built in a day, and, and I think sometimes we have to approach uh, patients in a variety of ways. So let's make a contract to try and limit or reduce your drinking and see how that goes. Family involvement. Well, I, I think this is crucial to most diseases. You know, wherever we can get a team process going and reinforcements helping us all row in the same direction is, is wonderful. And then last but not least, specialist referral. Uh, there is a wide variety of clinicians, uh, not physicians, that are specially trained to treat substance abuse, LCDCs, Licensed Chemical Dependency Counselors, LPCs, Licensed Practical Counselors, um, so specialist referral. And then I have to confess, I, I think the, the last two bullets are crucial. Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, a marvelous organization, 80 years old now, begun by an alcoholic physician. Um, this is the centerpiece, in my opinion, for relapse prevention. You know, a group of people all striving in the same direction. Uh, Al-Anon, I, I never cease to be amazed when I mention Al-Anon, how most folks are confused by what Al-Anon is. Al-Anon is an organization for family members of patients that have alcohol problems. You know, family members are baffled. Uh, uh, does my husband drink because I don't love him enough? I love him too much. I'm too permissive. I'm too difficult. And the truth of the matter is what Al-Anon teaches family members is simply three things. You did not cause this illness. You cannot control it, no matter how hard you try. Okay. And, and the third piece is, you know, you're, you're not responsible for what happens to the patient. He or she is. Uh, they don't 
Elanon, I think, frightens family members. They think, well, I'm going to go there, and they're going to tell me to simply divorce him or her. No, Elanon asked the family member to detach with love from the disease and the patient, not detach from the patient. So you didn't cause it. You can't control it. You can't cure it. How about pharmacologic treatments? Well, um, it's amazing how much time we spend in medical school looking at the ravages of alcoholism like hepatitis and cirrhosis and how they treat us, I'm sorry, how, we, how they train us to treat acute withdrawal. And there's a good reason for it. Even though it's 2010, we still see patients that have delirium tremens and withdrawal seizures and 5% of them still die. So this is a medical emergency and it needs to be managed quickly and acutely with benzodiazepines, which, as you know, are anti-epileptics, and oftentimes with anti-convulsants. So the first order of business is let's get the patient through that critical 72-hour window post-drinking when they're at the greatest risk for a withdrawal seizure. But after that, I mean, that's the, the frightening tip of the iceberg physically, but then the rest of the iceberg that's 90% under the surface is relapse prevention. It's one thing for a patient to say, I've stopped drinking. It's another thing, altogether another thing, to stay stopped. And that is really the focus once the patient has been detoxified, staying stopped. That's where I think Alcoholics Anonymous is crucial. But we now have four approved FDA drugs for relapse prevention and a fifth one that may or may not get an FDA blessing. So a quick review, Antabuse has been around since the 1950s. It was a medicine that was stumbled on. Uh, the alcoholic patient in recovery takes an Antabuse pill every day, and it does absolutely nothing unless the patient drinks. And then there is an aldehyde alcohol chemical reaction, and the patient is as sick as a dog. They feel like they have the worst case of flu they've ever suffered from. So it's an adverse way to prevent relapse. Naltrexone. This is an opioid antagonist. It was developed in the late 60s, early 70s for heroin addicts. Heroin addicts take this medicine orally. It blocks opioid receptors in their brain, and if they shoot up with heroin, they get no euphoric effect. So it was heralded as a breakthrough. The trouble is most heroin addicts say, I know what I'll do. I won't take it. Okay. Now, there are substance abusers, opioid abusers, like doctors and nurses, who are more than happy to take naltrexone so they can preserve their license and continue to work. But in the late 70s, early 80s, this medicine was trialed in alcoholics, oddly enough. And it was noted that alcoholics that took naltrexone, this opioid blocker, that they drank less, that their abstinent days were longer, and that when they did drink, they drank differently. They didn't drink with the same fury. So this is an oral medicine used to, essentially as an anti-craving medicine. A camprosate. Uh, the, the brand name of Camprel. This is a European medicine. came to us in uh, the early 2000s. It's got some interesting effects in the central nervous system, but this is also thought to be an anti-craving medicine. It's a bit limited, though, because you have to take two pills three times a day, and it's also quite pricey, but, but it's blessed by the FDA uh, as an approved medicine to prevent relapse. And then the last uh, or the most recently approved medicine, Vivitrol. This is an intramuscular depot-based uh, injection of naltrexone. So the patient receives a shot once a month and it has a slow release. This kind of takes out of the hands of the patient day-to-day -day oral compliance. Um, this medicine looks to be pretty effective for relapse prevention and anti-craving. However, it's limited by its cost, which is about $900 a month. And then the last medicine, this is a nod to San Antonio, 
Topamax is an anticonvulsant. It was studied here in uh, the mid-2000s in early onset male alcoholics, a particularly difficult subpopulation to treat. And it was noticed in a three-month study that those early onset male alcoholics that were on Topamax, they drank dramatically less, were abstinent much longer, um, had very few, if any, binge drinking. Uh, so there is strong evidence that Topamax may be a helpful medicine, although it's not FDA approved in this disease state. So what's the, uh, the prognosis for elderly alcoholics? Well, a couple of bullets here, simple things. If you can find them, and they're extremely rare, specialized age-specific programs appear to have better outcomes. Now you say, what's a better outcome? Is the patient sober six months post-treatment, a year post-treatment? But again, these are very rare. The, the one I'm familiar with <coughs> is the Hanley Center in Palm Beach, Florida. It's very age-specific. We think that with elderly alcoholics, Confrontation is a horrible idea. They'll go underground. They'll go south. So the supportive approach, at least in general terms, appears to be the way to head. Cognitive behavioral therapy, where you kind of give rational, uh, you kind of explore irrational ideas, explode them, and replace them with more rational ideas. When you wed that to relapse preventive, preventive measures like AA and medicine, get great outcomes. And then the last one, this may sound like it's a little bit talking out of both sides of my mouth. Uh, when the patient is stable, recovered, detoxified, they've got uh, good early sobriety, if they participate in mixed age 12-step programs, oddly enough, that seems to be more effective than age-specific 12-step programs. Of course, it's kind of curious why that is. So closing thoughts uh, as we hit the, the time bell here. Addiction knows no age limit, doesn't respect age, doesn't respect profession. <clears throat> uh, we want to suspect always. We'd like to identify as early as we can. The earlier we treat something, the better our chances are for success. We want to treat early. And then maybe the, the most important thing to remember is it is possible to teach an old dog new tricks. Uh, everyone is down in our beloved spurs because they're an old team, but I think they've got a couple new tricks left. And on that note, I think I'd best take some questions. So, thanks. <clears throat> um, you, you'd think I would have learned by now to sort through them, but I'll just take them as they are. So. Here in the Texas Hill Country, there is so much denial in regard to alcoholism. So my question is, who places the patient? The patient, the family, law enforcement, or a judicial entity? Well, uh, I'll say all of the above. And, and I'll say, and I'm not trying to, to sound like a politician, it depends. I think in, in terms of my experience, rarely does the patient place themselves unless uh, they have literally a gun to their head. Their employer says, you get treatment or you're fired. Their spouse says, you get treatment or I leave you. But oftentimes the patient is so sick, even those uh, powerful incentives fall on deaf ears. And in fact, the patient becomes quite resistant. But it's certainly been my experience that sometimes patient rec re patients recognize, particularly I think when physical consequences strike. I'm thinking about a 75-year-old a woman I, I, I saw this past year who'd had a number of falls. And I think she just, you know, I don't know what fall it was, number three or four, that she said, I have to acknowledge that uh, my part in this is that I'm drinking heavily every day and it's affecting my balance and it's a matter of time before I, I die from a fall or suffer a great consequence. The family. Quite often, I think the family uh, can be very powerful in persuading, convincing the patient to treatment. You know, we're all familiar from these wonderful reality TV shows about the term intervention. 
You know, so the patient is so sick they're not able to see the self-destruction they're involved in. So we now carefully assemble the, the, the immediate family, the close friends, maybe the, the co-workers. Uh, we, we have a little bit of a, of a coaching. We're going to meet with the patient now. Each of you just simply give a single example of when you've seen the patient impaired and the consequences and simply say your piece. And I think, you know, maybe this is a show of force or uh, uh, numbers, but I think oftentimes that helps overwhelm the patient's uh, diseased resistance to getting treatment. So I think the family can be very effective. Twenty years ago, uh, you know, mental health, uh, law enforcement, uh, the, the judicial or legislative arm was quite involved. You know, we would see involuntary commitments for substance abuse, and it would be fairly commonplace because we had a system to support it. You know, our state hospital in San Antonio actually had a dedicated substance-dependent unit that no longer exists. So I won't say that involuntary hospitalizations are, are no longer done, but they're just, I'll say, the exception rather than the rule. So, what about those with dual diagnosis such as alcoholism and bipolar? How do you treat? Well, um, I, I would begin with a with the novena and a lot of prayers, but I'll just simply say, I think you need to treat both diseases simultaneously and equally. Although the truth be known, if someone has bipolar illness and they're actively drinking or using drugs, you're going to make limited inroads. So you probably need a, a lot of early attention on achieving uh, some platform of sobriety but you're certainly not going to neglect the bipolar illness until you achieve that. So I'd say you have to zero in on both illnesses, but at least early on you have to secure the foothold in terms of sobriety and abstinence. Do you find that doctors, through their training in geriatrics, are learning and dialoguing about this disease? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I live in a phone booth. I'm a solo practitioner, uh, so I, I, I can only guess. I mean, the, the idealistic part of me uh, believes that uh, particularly primary care doctors uh, who, upon whom the, the, the burden of caring for the elderly is more and more falling to them, I think that they're, they have to be conscripted or drafted into this education. So my, my fantasy, my, my hope, my idealistic belief is, is yes, but I, I don't have any specific data on their awareness of it. Relapse prevention medications, do they have addiction properties? Wow, what a, what a curious question. So those five drugs that we talked about, antabuse, naltrexone, acamprosate, vivitrol, and topamax, do they have addictive properties, meaning is there tolerance? Not to my knowledge. Is there physical withdrawal if they're suddenly stopped? Not to my knowledge. Is there loss of control? Again, not to my knowledge, although, you know, I'm, I'm going to read this question a little differently Sometimes uh, folks ask me if antidepressants are addictive. And I think that, that maybe the answer that, that's being sought here is if we take a medicine that helps us relieve symptoms, it becomes a, quite a decision when we're asked to give this medicine up. So are we psychologically uh, connected to it? So perhaps that's really the, the gist there. Have you seen an increase in alcohol and drug dependence since the baby boomers are now approaching 65? The short answer is absolutely. By 2020, 20% of our U.S. population will be 65 and older. Okay, so 10 years away. And they're healthier. And they also have more resources. They've got more money. They have a very active lifestyle. And those baby boomers have passed through the 60s. So they're familiar with lots of 
recreational drugs. They're quite familiar with alcohol. So this is a problem that's only going to expand logarithmically. So absolutely. Do you think the male-female ratio changes with the baby boomer generation? I'm not exactly sure. Maybe it's the, the six to one male to female alcohol. Um, my hunch is that uh, it, it probably will change and it'll change, unfortunately, increasing numbers for females. That, that's my hunch. What are the side effects of antibodies for the elderly? Seems it could be dangerous. Absolutely. Uh, even in young patients on antibodies, there have been deaths. So this is not a medicine to be used lightly. The antibodies reaction can be profound, profound in terms of hypotension, dehydration, uh, a dramatic physical effect. So all the attendant risks need to be discussed in full. And, and I'll just simply say that I think the antibuse in patients 65 and older is not the first medicine you'd turn to, but it's, it, it's something that you would certainly consider. But it, it's by far the riskiest of the five we talked about. Does Medicare cover treatment for the elderly related to alcoholism? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a coding specialist. I, I kind of hand that off to my, my beloved secretary. Um, but I certainly know that, uh, you know, I, I've, I've assessed elderly patients and diagnosed alcohol abuse, 305.00, and alcohol dependence. Can't remember that number. And as far as I know, um, Medicare hasn't tossed those back. But uh, that's a pretty, I'm, I'm on very thin ice there. What, what type of items are included in a contract with the elderly to reduce use? How does it work? How many goals? How long? Well, again, I, I think it depends. Maybe we should say that this contract is at first a conversation and you're trying to assess uh, that patient's motivation and insight. Um, and I'd, I'd like the, I mean, ideally, I'd like the goals and the direction to be joint as opposed to unilateral. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll talk about a model here. This is a, a motivation to change model by, uh, by the brilliant psychologist Prokaska. And basically Prokaska says people don't change like light switches. They change like dimmer switches, not on and off, but a dimmer. And that there are, are five components to this pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. So we'll take, uh, say, for example, a smoker, someone smoking three packs a day for 40 years. They, they don't even have the thought that they should quit. But now they see their primary care doctor, and for the 40th time, the primary care doctor says, Mr. Flabeats, I think your health would greatly benefit if you were to consider stopping smoking. So we've planted the seed, and maybe the patient for the first time ever begins to pre-contemplate this. Right? They still smoke three packs a day. And now downstream, perhaps they've got a bad bronchitis and they're short of breath for the first time in their life and they go back to see the doctor. And the doctor says, you know, this is gonna be difficult to treat because your lungs are weakened. They're weakened by 120 pack years of cigarettes. So again, I'm going to urge you to think seriously about stopping smoking. And now the patient has kind of moved from pre-contemplation to contemplation. Still smoking like a chimney. He continues to feel bad. Maybe he's got more shortness of breath going up steps. Maybe he's just not the way he, he likes to be. Maybe his wife or kids have suggested, Dad, we implore you, please stop smoking. And now he says, you know, I wonder what it would take to stop smoking. I'm going to investigate this with my doctor, with my friends who've quit. So the patient is now preparing. They're still smoking three packs a day. They're preparing, okay? And hopefully their primary care doctor is each and every point along the way in this circle is moving them to the next step. Well, the doctor says, Mr. Fobitz, if you want to stop smoking, you know, I'd like you to taper down, pick a quit date, We'll use a patch right around the quit date. I'd like you to go to an American Lung Association 
tobacco cessation groups. You're with other people doing the same thing. And, and now we come to the fourth stage, action. The patient says, all right, doc, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm ready now. And he follows through. And he's successful. But you don't stop there on the dimmer switch because now you have to maintain it. What do we need to do to maintain it? So that might be a contract, if you will, although we'll change the, the uh, substance from tobacco to, uh, to alcohol. And we've got one minute left. The last question, my mother denies she has a problem. I think she does. Do you have any suggestions for what a family can do? Well, I guess my suggestion would be don't give up. Think about our model that we just talked about. I didn't realize that comes to play here. Pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action. <coughs> uh, I would say gentle persistence in terms of state reality. Mom, last night I found you passed out. I'm worried about you. I love you. I'd like to see you live a long, happy, healthy life. Okay? Not a life with sickness and impairment. And I just stay stay with it. And on that note, I best cease and desist. So. <laughs>